Hi, and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining me. Uh, today, I want to talk about a relatively recent development in using machine learning to uh, kind of dream up or hallucinate images, um, which I think is a really exciting topic um, that could have um, potentially a lot of impact on a lot of fields, um, including uh, game development, which is more my background. Um, so in case um, you don't know who I am, my name is Oliver Franzke. I am a principal programmer at Double Fine Productions. Um, you can find me on Twitter on a pixel coder. And I've been working in the game industry for quite a while, have shipped a whole bunch of games. Um, my background is more in graphics and low-level systems programming. And I was also a lead programmer uh, on Broken Age. But like I said, today I want to talk about a slightly different topic. Um, and I should preface that, you know, like I said, my background is in graphics and system programming, and I'm not a machine learning expert. And I only relatively recently started to, you know, read papers um, on a subject and to work myself into the field. Um, so while this is a, you know, the goal is for this to be a high level technical presentation, it's possible uh, that I'm you know, missing some crucial parts, or maybe there are some mistakes. If you notice something, please let me know so I can correct it. Um, and additionally, there's a lot of stuff I'm kind of omitting here that I don't really have time to talk about, or I just don't know, uh, you know uh, too much about it to really confidently talk about it. OK, now, before I'm going to talk about how these computer hallucinations work under the hood, I want to quickly provide you with some information on um, some of the use cases. So one of the most common use cases you'll find on the internet um, is this generation of an image from some kind of text font. So in this case, for example, I specified Cyberpunk World in Red. And on the right side, you can see how the computer kind of dreams up an image that matches this description. Um, and it's actually quite amazing how close it gets to, uh, to my goal uh, description. And you can also do this on photos or other images, uh, which is a process I call image verification where in addition to a text prompt, you provide a machine learning model with a starting photo or image. And then it will go and it will keep transform this uh, to get closer and closer to the text prompt that you uh, specify. And while the final version is really you know, much different from the input, you can see at least structurally, it's pretty close though. You, know, you can see there's clearly some kind of figure in the center of the frame. And this also works in videos. Um, so you can turn yourself into some weird alien dude or you know, put a robot face on. And um, there's a lot of temporal incoherence. So stuff is popping around. And that's just kind of the nature of um, these methods, at least at the moment. And then lastly, um, there's what I would call an infinite zoom, where you essentially use these machine learning models to kind of zoom in or, or move around the space and the computer will just keep dreaming up more and more uh, image information where there previously was none. And so you can have these seemingly infinitely uh, complex journeys to these cool uh, visual scapes um, that you, know, you would love to explore. Um, okay, so how does this actually work? And it really seems like magic and it's something that you know shouldn't work at all. Uh, but it's actually surprisingly simple. Uh, really just two steps. First, you need to compute um, the match between the current image that the computer produced and the text prompt that you specified as the goal. And then using that information, you update the image. And there are two very common methods that are used at the moment. Uh, one is called VQGAN and the other is called guided diffusion. And I'll talk about both of those as well as computing the image to text uh, match. In fact, let's jump right in there. Um, now, the most commonly used model for this is called CLIP, which stands for Contrastive Language Image Pre-Training, uh, which is a machine learning model created by OpenAI, an organization in San Francisco, that essentially allows you to uh, give the um, computer a picture or a photo, and it will come back with some kind of you know, text description of that. So for example, you in this case, you give it a picture of an airplane and indeed it comes back with 89% likelihood that this is a photo of uh, an airplane. And it also works for non-photos, like you can see here on the right side with the illustration of the Siberian Husky. Uh, and again, it, it gets this right. And the way this works is um, OpenAI created kind of software that crawls the internet for images and videos that have some kind of text description associated with it. 
And then it feeds both of these into the machine learning model to essentially, you know, figure out some kind of mapping between the image and the text. And if you do this with, you know, millions and millions of images and you know, text description pairs, you can come up with something really cool. But how does this help us to create images? Because really we want to kind of do the opposite. We want to give it a text description. We want to get out an image. Well, let's look at it. So let's say we want to create an image with the prompt Cyberpunk World in Red. The first thing you do is you initialize your target image or your image with some random noise. So that's what we've done here on the left side. And then you uh, take a part of that image, which internally is called a cutout, and you send that to Clip. And then you ask it, what is this that you see? And maybe in this case, it will come back with a description of leather. And then I'm going to omit a whole bunch of details here, but essentially it's possible to calculate a numeric difference between those two um, text. So the difference between Cyberpunk World and Red and Leather in my made up example here, maybe it would be 77.3, uh, which is, you know, a pretty large number and which is because Leather as a description is pretty far removed from Cyberpunk World and Red. All right. Now then you pick another random part of the image and again, you send it to Clip and it comes back maybe this case with Fly in a Soup, which is weird, but again, it's pretty, pretty far removed from where we want to be. Again, the difference is very high. And then you do this a whole bunch of more times. Typically, and this is done between 16 and 64 times per iteration step. And then you can use all of these um, differences you calculate to create an average difference, which in machine learning terms is called a loss. And then using this average difference, you can update the image. And I'm going to talk about how that works uh, in a minute. But let's just assume you know we have some magical method here. And after a while, it comes up with this. So again, now you're going to ask Clip, what do you see in this part of the image? And maybe now Clip will say, well, this looks like red sky to me, which is closer because we specify we want red when we said Cyberpunk will have it. Um, but it's still far removed because it's not you know, a Cyberpunk city. Uh, but the difference is less than what it was before. You know, Now it's around 40. Maybe previously it was around 70 or 80. So the difference has gone, gone down, but there's still some you know, room for improvement. So again, you let it run for a while. And or maybe now we'll come back with the description of red building, which is great because uh, cyberpunk world has a whole bunch of buildings and we want red. So it's much closer to where we want to go. And the difference has gone down even further. So, you know, what you're doing is you're essentially running this iteratively and to converge uh, on an image that matches your text description best. Um, and uh, you can visualize this process um, pretty neatly. So here's something I found that was made by Remy Durand on Twitter. And so you can see these green boxes are uh, the cutouts that being sent to Clip. And the color encoding here is how often you send a part of the image to Clip. Um, so uh, you know, the center of the image is being you know, covered more frequently, um, which is pretty cool. All right. So now that we have this numeric difference between the text prompt that is our goal and the current image, now what do, you, what do we do with this? Well, let's look at the first method I mentioned earlier, VQGAN, which stands for Vector Quantized Generative Adversarial Networks, which was introduced in this awesome paper called Taming Transformers by uh, Patrick Esser, Robin Rombach, and Bjorn Omer from Heidelberg University. And so the picture you can see here at the bottom is indeed a synthetic image that was created um, by their machine learning model. And then, you know, it looks really, you know, stunning, like a high resolution, very realistic uh, version of a landscape. Okay, well, let's break this name of a vector, vector quantized generative adversary networks apart so that we can, you know, figure out what's happening here. Let's zoom in on the GAN part, so the generative adversary on a network. And the goal is here to create a piece of a machine learning model, like a piece of software that can create pictures. So in this case, maybe we want to have um, a generator that can make pictures of red robots. And so maybe in this case, it already ran for a while and it came up with this image. Now that's cool. That's clearly some kind of robot, but it's not red. So what do you do with that? How can you improve this? And this is where the discriminator comes in, which is the other crucial part of a GAN. And the goal of a discriminator is to figure out whether or not the picture it's currently looking at was created by the generator, or in other words, is fake, or is it an image that was provided by the user, in other words, is, is real. So you have to question, you know, is the image 
fake or real? And then maybe in this case, it will uh, say, okay, well, I think this is fake because it's a robot, but it's not red. And then using this feedback um, and, the, and the knowledge whether or not it actually was fake or real, it can then use this to update the internal parameters of both the generator as well as the discriminator to improve the quality of both of these elements. Now, the crucial part is that you don't just send it photos from the or pictures from the generator, but also randomly from the real data set. So again, the discriminator sees this image and, and the question is, is this real? Is it a photo that was provided by the user or is it something that was created by the generator? And the important part here is that the discriminator does not know where this picture uh, came from. So maybe in this case, it correctly detected, yep, that was an image you know, provided by the user and it gets it right. And then again, using this uh, information, it can update the parameters of the generator and discriminator. So this is where the adversarial network comes in. Like essentially you have these two machine learning systems that are both improving over time while this runs iteratively, iteratively um, to just get higher and higher quality output, both from the generator and the discriminator. And this works really amazingly well, like um, it was presented by NVIDIA in the form of StyleGAN, for example, um, which is a model you can use to create these stunning images of people. So these, these pictures you, you see here were made by a machine learning you know, model. Not, these are not photos of real people. Um, so it's quite amazing how, uh, how far we can get with that. But let's go back, you know, how does this help us to create images from text? Now let's look at the vector quantized part of the VQGAN name. And uh, one important aspect here is that the VQGAN operates on image patches and on a pixel. So you take the image that you created so far and you split it up into tiles. And then you take these tiles and you run through an encoder. And this encoder will come up with some kind of numeric representation of that, uh, which is in a paper called Z. Um, and this is uh, essentially kind of an array of vectors that contain just real numbers, like you know, 1.3, 2.7, 9.4, whatever. Um, and these numbers are referring to the data set that VQGAN was trained on. So I should mention that before you use the VQGAN to make your images, it had previously already seen you know, thousands and thousands of images to essentially tell the, the machine learning model of VQGAN what valid images are. So let's say it was trained on ImageNet, um, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit more later on. Um, so these Z values that you know, it figured out from the original image that you fed into it, kind of refer to this data set and you know, individual parts of that. And then, like I said, now these are kind of just vectors of, of real numbers. And then what you do is you quantize those. Now the easiest um, form of quantization is you essentially strip the, um, the remaining part of a real number. So if something was, let's say 1.3, you remove the uh, 0.3 and you end up with just one. Now this is not really actually what's done in this uh, method here, but something very similar. So you end up with a quantized part and um, you can then use this uh, to you know, create the next iteration of the image. So you essentially take patches from the original data set and merge them together into the next you know, image. And so this is what the generator looks like on the inside uh, for, the, uh, for the GAN. Now the discriminator doesn't really matter to us right now here for our specific purpose. What's much more interesting is where um, do we feed in the kind of the image to text uh, match that we calculated earlier with clip. And indeed, what you do is you use this average uh, difference or the loss rather to tweak the values of these Z values. So um, these representations of these patches of the original image, oh, sorry. Um, and you tweak the Z values in such a way that the output of um, the next step is closer to where you want to go. So sometimes it's called gradient descent. And essentially what you're doing is uh, you change the values of Z a little bit, and then you calculate an image and you look at whether or not that image uh, is closer to the goal. So if the, the loss is less than it was previously, and if that's the case, then you keep heading in this direction. So you keep tweaking Z in kind of similar fashion. And if it's getting further away, then you change direction essentially in, in which you wanna tweak Z. And you just keep doing this iteratively and you improve the image over time. 
So here you can see this happening kind of uh, over time. Um, using the prompt Cyberpunk City, you can see how VQGAN over like 150 or 200 steps or so kind of, uh, you know, creates an image. So you can see out of kind of this um, the random noise in the beginning, slowly shapes starting to emerge, and then they kind of wobble around a little bit, which is due to the, the quantization and the randomness in the algorithm, and also you know how clip you know looks at different parts of the image randomly. Um, so that's why often when you see these kind of machine learning images and animations, you see this kind of random um, random wobbling. But it does work, and really very amazingly effective to create images from a target description. OK, so let's move on to the next algorithm that's sometimes used, or rather machine learning model, and that's called guided diffusion, which was introduced by Prafula Darival and Alex uh, Nicole, again, from OpenAI. Um, now, I should mention that um, even though you know, this is the paper that's often used for these image generation methods, it was built on other previous um, work in this, in this direction. Um, but uh, what the question here is essentially is, you know, how can you create an image from random noise? So let's say, you know, again, you initialize the image with noise, like how can you get to some uh, target image? Um, now, the important part here is that guided diffusion is fundamentally different from VQGAN because it operates on pixels and not on patches. Um, and the question that these researchers asked themselves were, well, what happens if you render process in reverse? So maybe starting with some kind of picture, like in this case, picture of my cats when they were younger. Um, like what happens if you add a little bit of noise to it? And then, you know, you just add some more noise to it and you keep doing that and you keep adding more and more noise. And the question is, is it possible to, add, to reverse these individual noise steps? So in other words, can you remove noise from an image to get back to the previous iteration of, of that image? And it turns out if you pick your noise very carefully, and if you only add a very little bit of noise at every step, you can indeed do this, which to me still seems really mind-bogglingly crazy because essentially what that means out of you know, a lot of entropy or a crazy amount of entropy, you can essentially you know, create information, which seems like something that should work, but it, it does work. Um, okay, so where do we feed in the, um, the text image prompt? you know, uh, match that we calculated. And you probably guessed it, we are using this to um, tweak the noise removal step. So this is where the guided comes in. So you're guiding this diffusion process, so um, the noise removal uh, with the loss that you calculated previously. And the, the details are, you know, really complex here, but essentially at every step, um, diffusion, you can get kind of a distribution of noise uh, functions that you could remove. And you use um, the clip loss to pick which specific set of parameters of noise you want to remove for the next iteration. And so you do this at every single step along the way, and you slowly, slowly get closer and closer to um, the image that you want to get to. Okay, uh, so this is kind of how, how diffusion works. There's really not more to it, of course, like I said, the actual details and the motivation details are much more complex. There's a lot of stuff I, I had to leave out. Now, one thing I want to mention very quickly is where do the pixels come from when you use these machine learning methods to create images? And I kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier uh, when I talked about VQGANIS, and that is every single model that is used, like be it CLIP or Diffusion or VQGAN, was previously trained on some existing data set. Um, so a common data set that's often used uh, for these image tasks is called ImageNet, which contains around 40 million images with more than 20,000 categories. But the others too, like Coco or Wikiar, which contains paintings and illustrations from different artists. And what is important here is that the machine learning model can only really work within a domain that it was trained on. So for example, if you train uh, VQGAN on the CARS data set from Stanford, then you would not be able to use VQGAN to create pictures of cats. Sorry, crumpy cat. Um, and um, so what this means is that you can only really create stuff that it previously kind of was trained on. So it can't just come up um, with stuff out of thin air. Like it's not AI, it's not general intelligence. It can't figure things out. It needs to be trained on something. And the interesting thing, you can actually see this. 
So if you run uh, guided diffusion before kind of the weirdification process steps in, um, you get this coming back from the guided diffusion. Um, so these are the early steps before kind of the weirdness starts happening. And what is interesting is if you look at the left side here, this picture, you can see it's you know clearly you know it's close to the photo that I provided as an input, but it's clearly very different. Like there's a dude there, that's true, but it's you know you can see the face is different. And what's really interesting is this dude here in the picture is actually smiling, whereas if you look at the photo of me, I'm not really smiling because I'm German and I live in Germany, and by law we're not allowed to smile. All right, just joking. Of course we are, um, but anyway, so you, you can see that you know it, it just it's a completely different uh, person. And the reason for that is that, you know, these data models, um, or, sorry, machine learning models that were trained on existing data sets probably have seen a lot of selfie photos. Um, and, you know, what does a selfie photo look like? So you have a person in the center and often they're smiling at the camera. Um, and so the average person it knows that this kind of in this configuration will be something like this. So I a person there that's smiling. Um, and then so you can, you know, run, get a diffusion with different parameter sets. And so you can get closer to um, the original photos, but even that, which is looks more like me than the one on the left, is still pretty far removed. And so I find this really, really interesting because you can kind of peek into the data set and into, you can kind of get a glimpse of what's in there. Um, and uh, it really can only use that information to then come up with new stuff. Um, all right. Um, now, one thing I haven't mentioned is like how these infinite zoom um, animations work. And really, having talked about these individual steps of the text image prompt matching and the different algorithms to create the images using that, is actually pretty straightforward. So let's say you have an image that was produced by an ML algorithm. What you really do is you just apply some kind of you know image transformation. For example, like this, you zoom in and rotate a little bit. And then you use that as an input for the next step of the machine learning uh, model to come up with something based on that. Um, so starting with this, you zoom in and you know, rotate a little bit, and then you, you know, let the machine learning system hallucinate some new information on top of that. And with that, you can just keep doing this over and over again, and you come up um, with this seemingly infinite amount of um, information that it can create. And it works amazingly well and creates some really cool, cool stuff. Um, all right, that's kind of concludes the kind of uh, theoretical aspect of, um, of my presentation. And now I want to show you uh, some of the Google, Google Color pages that you can use uh, to try this yourself. You can actually run uh, VQGAN and Guided Diffusion uh, at home in a, in a browser to play with this yourself. Um, so let's jump into that so you can see how that works. All right, cool. Well, let's look at one of these um, methods to create images from a text prompt. Uh, let's start off with VQGAN. Um, and one of my favorite uh, implementations is the multi-perceptor VQGAN uh, made by Remy Durand that I already mentioned earlier. So if you like this kind of machine learning aesthetic, I, uh, you know, recommend you check out Remy on Twitter. So it's a really interesting stuff there. Um, and so he created this, what's called a call-up page, which is just uh, essentially a front end for Python that runs on a server. Um, now is, you have a whole bunch of things you can configure. Uh, for example, I will disable the usage of Google Drive for now. Um, you can specify how often you want to see updates on the website, you know, as the, the model iterates, I said that every 10 iterations. Now, these are the really interesting ones under do the run. So here's the text prompt um, of, you know, the text you want to uh, explore visually. I'm going to just leave the default for now. You can also, you know, tweak the resolution, although I recommend you leave it at the default because running these machine learning models requires a really beefy GPU and lots of VRAM. And if you make the resolution too big, then uh, the Python will crash Then CUDA can't allocate, you know, that required memory. Um, and then, oops, sorry about that. Um, you can also specify the clip model here. Um, and I don't know too much about the differences exactly. So I'm just going to leave it at default. And uh, the VQGAN model, um, which uh, is just represents the data set that was trained on. So you see ImageNet that I talked about and Coco and Wikiart 
I'm just going to leave it on image net for now. And then you have a whole bunch of other values you can tweak. Uh, now, normally, um, if you run these, you can say, you know, run all these different blocks so you can see the individual blocks that you can run manually by clicking on the play button. So normally in runtime, you can say run all of these, but there's some problem today with that. So I'm not going to do that. I guess I will have to run them, uh, run them uh, manually one by one. Uh, so you can click on that and you can already see, you know, this takes a little bit of time. Um, um, so I'm just going to be clicking through that and I'm going to probably uh, speed up the video until something interesting happens. And then I'll be back to say a few words and then uh, again, speed up the video after that. All right. Okay. On to the next thing. Okay. Just one. All right, now before I'm going to click the do the run button, I uh, just want to point out up here on the top right, you can see uh, the RAM usage and disk. Um, so since I don't have a Colab Plus account, I only have the like minimal server side uh, resources. Um, so you have to keep an eye on that. Like if you download a lot of stuff on here, you know, you might run out of, out of space or RAM. Okay, and I'm going to click run and um, should start spinning. And I can go to the bottom. You can actually see some output. So what it does right now, it's, it's downloading um, the, the, the image net model that VQGAN was pre-trained on to create um, the image. Um, so that will take a few seconds. Uh, and then it will start running and creating iteratively uh, the image. And um, again, I'll speed up the recording here uh, until something interesting happens. And then I'll yeah, say a few words. Um, OK, but before that, I okay, guess so while it's spinning, I can say um, I'll share the link to this two different call up pages that I want to share on the YouTube description. So you can check that out. And then also, additionally, if you want to know more about this stuff, um, there's a really cool YouTube channel called Two Minute Papers, which talks a lot about different AI methods, um, which is very inspiring. So you know you should go and check that out. As well as if you're more interested in the really hardcore technical details, you can find uh, Yannick um, on YouTube as well. And he really goes deep on these papers and he actually knows what he's talking about. And he's got a PhD um, in machine learning. Um, yeah, so you should check that out. All right, cool. So I think now it's started. No, it's still downloading clip. But in a second, I will actually um, start generating the, the image. Um, and then it just takes a little bit if it runs on a server. So you can see here, you know, the initial image, this noise, which looks very similar to, you know, what I showed you um, when I talked about the text image matching using clip. And that's not a surprise. I actually grabbed the real output from uh, VQGAN for that. Um, and then you can see the learning rate, so the loss uh, rather uh, over here as it's going down. Um, and you can see um, the steps over here. And this is the iteration. Um, so right now we are still on the first iteration, I guess. Um, oh, and here now we created already updated an image. Now the text prompt again is like the Enchanted Garden by uh, painted by James Gurney, and so you know as time goes on, it will uh, refine this more and more. So it starts up with random noise, then you know, after 25 steps, uh, it ends up as this image, and then in a second we're gonna reach like 50 steps, um, iteration steps. So it's gonna gonna improve from there. Um, do, 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 do. Almost there. And we should here. There you go. There's the next one. So you can see, like, progressively, it's refining the image and adding more and more detail. Um, and it's actually really amazing um, the kind of stuff it can come up with. So I'm going to let it run to just one more output step um, before I'm going to switch over uh, to the second collab about you know implementing guided diffusion that I want to show you. Um, but yeah, so this is the multi perceptor VQ GAN call up is really cool. Um, go check it out, play with it, and feed in some really you know weird text to see what uh, the computer uh, hallucinates given that prompt. Okay, cool. So this is after 75 iteration steps. It looks like this, and it's pretty cool. You see like some human figures, and clearly it's a garden. 
And all of this was just produced from noise. And just, just let that sink in. It's actually, I know, pretty, pretty cool. All right, cool. Well, let's look at the second collab page. Uh, this one is one that implements the guided diffusion. Uh, it's made by some night dreams, I actually know how it's pronounced. Also, um, someone who creates really cool stuff in the space of machine learning imagery. Um, you know, uh, you know, follow that guy. And actually, I really highly recommend the uh, Nick Lang emoji bot, which creates um, machine learning images from emojis. There's some really, really cool uh, images coming out of that one. So anyway, so he or she created this uh, collab page that implements diffusion. Um, again, um, this, yep, yep, uh, has these individual cells that you can uh, run. And I'm gonna turn off Google storage again, and I will have to run these individual cells. Um, so while this is happening, um, I can talk about some of the things um, that it's doing. So um, now it's downloading a whole bunch of stuff. Um, now, again, it has kind of very similar things. So batch name is the same as the text prompt. I'm actually going to use the same one as earlier, uh, Enchanted Gone by James Gurney. Um, resolution, um, it's just picked the same one. I believe the other one was 600 by 400 just so it's a little bit faster uh, and we can always um, we can always play with higher resolutions later um, then still doing stuff up here good the, the maximum number of iteration steps that has a bunch of you know tweaking parameters you can play with i'm not going to say too much about it right now um, where is oh yeah display rate i'm going to set the display rate to 10 so it shows an image every 10 iterations just so that we can actually see something. Um, so just like before, it actually has to download all these different data models, which is what it's doing right now. Um, um, now, if you do use the Google storage, which is something I disabled up here, it could actually store all that stuff on your Google Drive, and then you wouldn't need to re-download it every single time. Um, anyway, uh, again, I'm going to uh, be quiet now and speed up the video uh, until something interesting happens and then I'll say a few words. Okay. All right. Um, welcome back. So now it actually initialized all the different things and downloaded the data. Uh, now I did run this before and I noticed um, I hadn't configured it correctly uh, because it turns out the batch name is really just the name of the batch. So you could just you know, call this test. Um, and the actual text prompt that you want to run is down here in prompts, which makes sense. Um, so I'm just going to use the same prompt here that I used earlier, speak again. And then the nice thing about the, this diffusion collab is that you can actually you know, change the, the text prompt as you uh, calculate animations. So you can see that here how this is done. So anyway, important is if you change the prompt, you need to make sure to rerun this block. Otherwise, it won't pick up the the data. And then I noticed this actually because I saw that it produced an image with the original prompt that was in the collab that was creating some kind of lighthouse. Um, so now I changed the prompt. So let's see what happens. Uh, now, as you can see, you know, we're starting out with random noise, just like before we speak again. Um, looks a little bit different. Uh, doesn't matter though. Noise is noise. Well, actually, that's not true at all. Um, it usually matters which noise. Uh, but yeah, so this is the starting point. You can configure the type of noise you want to start with, um, or like I said, provide some kind of image as a starting reference. Uh, and then it starts you know, iterating. So you can see slowly the progress bar uh, going up, and we'll see what it will come up with with the same prompt um, you know, compared to the one that we used earlier. And um, I'm going to shut up again and let this you know, do some stuff see what the diffusion comes up with and then come back at the end to uh, just conclude this presentation All right enjoy uh, these intermediate images showing up much much faster for you than they are for me since i'm going to speed up the video
Right, uh, I'm back actually. But, uh, apparently some kind of internet, internet outage, so it stopped prematurely. Uh, but as you can see, we made it to um, 153 steps out of 250, and it already looks pretty cool. Definitely can see a garden, looks pretty enchanted to me as well. Um, definitely looks different than what we can produce. And that's kind of the beauty that you have these two different methods that actually often do produce uh, pretty different, drastically different results. Um, but they are just, you know, tools in your toolbox you can use to create some really interesting uh, images from. And um, so, yeah, again, I'm going to share the link to uh, the Disco Diffu Diffusion collab as well in the YouTube um, comment section um, or description rather. And um, with that, I would like to say thank you all again uh, for joining me and sticking with it till the end. I hope you learned something new and that's interesting and I hope it's as exciting for you as it is for me, all these new uh, you know, machine learning methods. Um, and yeah, so enjoy playing with this. And uh, I can't wait to see what you can come up with. So um, goodbye, uh, until next time.